Hi, I'm Jay Phelan. Thanks for coming back. Let's talk now about how neurons work. This is the workhorse of the nervous system. We saw that nervous system is organized into a peripheral nervous system that receives information from the outside world about the environment, conveys it through interneurons to the central nervous system, brain integrates it, figures out what to do, then sends information back out through the peripheral nervous system to motor neurons to then affect some sort of response, either by contracting your muscles or causing a gland to release something, something like that. Well, let's look at how the neurons themselves work. We're gonna see that these cells, which are pretty universal across all the vertebrates, so you get some signal, and this is going to initiate an action potential. You hear about neurons firing, and when we refer to a cell firing, we mean that an action potential is occurring. So this happens, it's initiated in response to some stimulation from the outside. It might be sight or sound or tasting something along those lines. It's then gonna travel through the dendrites, through the cell body, and down the axon. So it goes in this one direction. At the end of the axon, at the terminal button, there's gonna be a synapse, and the synapse is the terminal button, the space between, and then the cell that is next to it. This muscle or gland or other neuron is maybe gonna respond, maybe not gonna respond, there's gonna be some regulation there. But that's how the cells work, typically. So all neurons, they are notable among cells in that they're specialized so that they can receive electrical and chemical information in their dendrites, we'll see how that's done, and then they can transmit it to other tissue via axons. So here's what our cell looks like. We know a lot about how these signals are transmitted because it turns out you can take these glass-tipped electrodes and you can insert them into a cell at various parts without killing the cell. So you can then detect What's the charge inside the cell relative to outside the cell? And we see that an electrical signal gets transmitted down the cell. The way an action potential works is like this. Typically, the cell is maintaining all sorts of different gradients. So for instance, the cell is continuously pumping sodium ions, NAs, pumping sodium ions outside of the cell. That means there are more of them out there than there are on the inside. So there's concentration gradient. This is sort of like pumping a bunch of water to a tower, a water tower on top of a building. That takes energy, but then it's sitting there, and now because, in that case, there's gravity, but in the case of neurons, you have just a concentration gradient. Later, without applying any energy, you can get something to happen. You, if you lose your power in the building, you can just open up the pipes and water will rush down. Same thing, you can open up a channel and sodium is going to rush in. So you've got sodium pumped out. You also have a bunch of potassium ions pumped in. So there are more of them inside the cell than there are outside. Typically, overall, all the charged ions that are either being pumped out or pumped in, there are lots of them even beyond just sodium and potassium, there is a membrane potential of about negative 70 millivolts that we measure in the cell. Now, when you get stimulation, what happens is that there are dendrites that are opening up their uh, sodium channels. And when they open up the sodium channels, because there's more sodium outside than inside, sodium rushes in. The cell becomes more positive. If then the stimulation stops, then it goes away. You can get a little, it becomes less and less negatively charged because you're adding positive ions into the cell. So it goes from negative 70 to negative 65 to negative 60. But if you stop, it just goes back down. And you're constantly pumping them out. This is why neurons require a lot of energy. If the stimulation continues and you get past some threshold, typically this is about negative 55 millivolts, then all of a sudden, all the sodium channels in the region open up. And now all this sodium that's been pumped out is gonna rush in and you get this very quick increase in the membrane potential so that the cell shoots up to maybe positive 50. This is all from positively charged ions rushing in. First we had the resting state, we cross the threshold and the cell becomes depolarized. Now the sodium is rushed in, the potassium channels are still closed. The next thing that happens is that you repolarize the cell. This happens by a bunch of 
potassium channels opening up. And remember, potassium is also positively charged and we've pumped way more inside the cell. So the potassium brushes out just against its concentration gradient. As you do that, you're losing positive charge. So the cell is becoming less and less positively charged. So it comes back down the membrane potential until it's even going to undershoot the negative 70 resting potential. Finally, the sodium channels have closed, the potassium channels close as well. You're doing the usual pumping of sodium ions out, pumping of potassium ions in, but just because you get to minus 70, the cell's not ready to fire just yet because in order to return to the resting state, you need to get concentration gradient of more sodium ions outside than there are inside. Concentration gradient, more potassium ions inside than outside, so that later when you stimu stimulate the cell, it can open up, sodium can rush in, you can get your action potential, potassium channels can open up, it rushes out, now you return. That spike is called an action potential or the cell firing. That's what neurons do. So it's either firing or not firing, kind of like in computers. You have all this capacity that computers can do, but they still work in a system that every, every one of the little registers, it's either a zero or a one. And so you can change them, but just through a lot of those signals together, you can communicate and interpret very complex information. The axon, I told you, was about three feet long and it is insulated with this white, gooey, fatty substance, myelin, which causes the signal to be able to move more quickly and more clearly, the way you would insulate a wire or a power cord or something like that that electricity is going to run through. But it has little gaps because if we're gonna have an action potential, you have to have sodium ions rush in. You have to have potassium ions rushing out. So you can't have it completely covered by myelin. So we have these gaps. It's not the entire thing open, but at these nodes of Ranvier, that's where the change in the ion concentrations can occur. So we see the signal jump down, the sodium channels open up here, sodium rushes in and we get the spike. And then inside we have diffusion of the ions. Then at the next node, we get sodium channels are opening, sodium rushes in and so on. So it kind of goes bing, 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 like that. And it moves down the axon. That's how it goes. It's called saltatory conduction from saltaire to jump. That's helpful. Um, <laughs> Anyway, here are some images where you can see the little gaps in the myelin in axons, allowing for that change in membrane potential to occur because of the chemical change of rushing of ions in, rushing of ions out. Here's a really cool one. Some researchers were studying the different types of channels, so they had stained them different colors, and you see it happening right there at the nodes of Ranvier. You can watch the membrane potential change in a linear fashion, that the cell is still in its kind of resting state right here in the axon, but further down the line, it's already started. I should also say this about the action potential, that I mentioned that you're at minus 70, your resting potential, and that if you get a little bit of stimulation, some sodium channels open up, that can cause sodium to rush in and it moves up. If it doesn't make it to the threshold to cause all of them to open up to get the spike in the positive charge of the membrane potential, if that doesn't happen and it goes back down, you go back to resting potential without an action potential. They call it all or none, either it happens or it doesn't. Like I said, the computer having either a zero or a one. There's nothing halfway in between. I think of it as like a flushing a toilet. It's a terrible analogy, maybe. I don't know. That if you tap down on the lever just a little bit, you can hear the water trickle, 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 but then you let go, it stops. Push a little more, trickle, 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 it stops. But if you push it a little bit too hard and the flush starts, you can't stop, it's gonna flush, and it's gonna flush exactly the same every time. That's kinda how the neuron is. When babies are first learning to walk, you see them really struggle, and they're trying, and it's not always clear because they don't have language yet, it's not clear what the challenge is. I mean, there might be many challenges, 
But our understanding of how the nervous system works helps us to see that babies, when they're first learning how to walk, they have something in common with individuals who suffer from multiple sclerosis. And what that is, is this. You see babies and they're trying to walk and they're trying to walk. I remember having kids, everyone, it was so competitive. Oh, you know, your kid doesn't walk, our kid walked at nine months or whatever. It's somewhere around there between eight months and a year. And yeah, it felt really like I should have flashcards teaching our kids how to, how to walk. But anyway, that actually has nothing to do with it, whether you've trained them or taught them or your kid's smart. What happens is that when a baby is born, the cells haven't completely matured. They haven't put myelin around all the axons. First, you have the muscles that control the head and neck. They mature first, so you get the myelin, you can send signals that say, contract this muscle, contract that muscle, and you can, they can hold their head. Only later does the myelin get finished all the way down the arms to control those muscles. And only after that do you get the myelin around the motor neurons down on the trunk and the legs. So what happens is this baby can know exactly how to walk, contract this muscle, relax this muscle, contract this muscle, and so on. But if it's sending a signal down and the myelin isn't there, the signal dissipates because you have leakage of ions all the, all the time. By the time it gets to the muscle in the foot or the leg, you have lost it. You don't have, you don't have the signal that says contract, contract. Only after about 9, 10, 11, 12 months do you have sufficient myelin that you can fully send that message down. Well, in people who have multiple sclerosis, what happens is an autoimmune condition where our body somehow attacks the myelin and the cells that produce myelin, it eats it away and it leaves scar tissue there. But by eating away the myelin, what happens is that essentially you get back to that situation where you can't insulate the cell, you can't send the signal, the action potential, as clearly because this leakage of ions makes it impossible to maintain the proper sodium concentration gradient or potassium ion concentration gradient. One last thing that I wanna say, once you have the action potential and then it, you return and it undershoots, the process by which you recreate a sodium ion concentration gradient outside the cell, a potassium ion concentration gradient inside the cell, is that you have these sodium potassium pumps. They take a huge amount of energy. It's like a motorized revolving door that we take a couple of ions of sodium, send it out, a couple of ions of potassium, send them in, a couple of ions of sodium, send them out. And the reason this takes energy is that you're pushing things against their concentration gradient. That takes energy to do, just like pumping water up to a water tower on the top of a building. That's why our brains use so much energy, because we have to keep restoring these neurons so that they are in their resting state after they have had an action potential. All right, one last thing now I wanna talk about how neurons work, and that is if you're in a situation where you're sitting there and you smell something. So I'm thinking about an external stimuli and how your brain is going to register that. So what I've drawn here, you see mucus within the nasal cavity and you have cells, these neurons, that have modified dendrites that within the dendrite, they have proteins embedded within the cell membrane. This, this receptor protein has a particular shape that it can bind to something. In the diagram here, I have these little molecules floating around labeled RB because there's a roast beef sandwich somewhere. You smell it. Well, how do you smell it? The molecule, the roast beef smell molecule, it might be a salty thing or a tangy thing or something like that, happens to fit perfectly into the receptor in the modified dendrite in the sensory neuron within the nasal cavity. When it binds there, it changes the conformation of the receptor such that it tweaks open a sodium channel. And what happens now? Sodium rushes in, as we saw, because it's been pumped out to create a concentration gradient. You initiate an action potential. So my diagram is kind of silly here, roast beef molecules, but there are lots and lots of things in the air that you can smell, thousands of different 
chemicals. We have lots of receptors for these that are going to bind. So here's a fancier diagram than mine, but if you look closely, it's the same as mine. It's molecules in the air. They fit in like a lock and key into one of these receptors. They pry open a sodium channel. Sodium rushes in. You have a connection to your brain. Your brain, because it's connected to that particular neon, says, ah, roast beef. All of the senses that we have, whether it is within our nasal cavity detecting airborne chemicals or on your tongue, say, for taste, in both of those cases, the thing that's going on is the chemical binds to the receptor. That causes a change in the receptor to open a sodium channel and initiates an action potential. I should say this, if you're sick and your immune system is trying to get rid of whatever pathogen you have, you can have a lot of mucus build up in your nasal cavity and it can swamp all of these receptors, these, these smell receptors. So back to these sensory receptors, you have them on your tongue for taste, you have them in your nasal cavity for smell. In our ear, I showed you the picture of hair cells, inner ear hair cells that move, and that physical change due to air pressure changes of sound are enough to cause mechanical changes to some receptor in your inner ear that then initiates an action potential and you detect that touch. So there's pressure. You, you put your hand on something, that pressure opens up a mechanoreceptor, sodium ions rush in, you initiate an action potential, and so on, or temperature, or sight. It's the energy of certain wavelengths of light hits the receptor, and these receptors respond to that. You have receptors for all these different wavelengths of light, but it's the same thing. It causes a physical change in the receptor so that sodium can rush in, so that a cell can initiate an action potential, so your brain, which is isolated from all of this, it just gets the signal in. It's like a computer on campus locked away in the server room. It's not in touch with the external environment, but because it has all of these, these connections to the outside world, it can get that information. So your brain is getting the information of what it sees, what it smells, what it hears, but it's all kind of secondhand information that it is receiving. Anyway, what we see is that whether you're looking at smell, here's a proboscis monkey, they've got a giant nose and good olfactory system, or the tongue, so the taste receptors that we have, or the optic nerves that are able to detect light, or sound, or touch, temperature, all of those different things. Our senses are all variations on a theme, that they are a cell that is responding to either some physical or chemical stimuli by opening up a channel within a neuron. So this receptor is embedded within the membrane, opens up a channel in response to this stimulation, and either stimulates or blocks an action potential. That's why you can have in other species completely different senses, something that responds to magnetic signals or something related to pressure. It's still gonna be the same thing. So as you look at different organisms and they have what we call their umwelt, their, their way that they see the world, it differs based on what senses, but from a nervous system perspective, they're all functioning in the same way. They're just variations on a theme. I'll stop there.